Other speaker here, Eric Lutke, who right. is an educator as well. Eric was a high school teacher. Middle school. Middle school the, teacher. The better level. The better level. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and Eric is a member of the House of Delegates. Uh, he has been there since, I think he got elected in 2010. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has just been uh, anointed the majority leader for the House of Representatives. Uh, and so he's going to talk uh, about a little bit, a little bit about what's happening past the recommendations um, for the, the commission and, and a little bit about what the funding fight is going to be like, I think. So, so we welcome. Have a three second pause. Three second? I need to stop and start this and go on. Okay. And, um, what a perfect time to pause. Yeah, mm -hmm. Those tables, beyond can, those tables, I can't see it. You so can no, 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 I've got it. So you get better. Right. We know. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> You can I, jump I, up. I was a middle school teacher, right? Okay. I, uh, you can jump uh, up and down. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to get attention. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. I am Eric Lutke. I am, uh, they don't actually anoint us, um, <laughs> although I'll, I'll propose that as a speaker. I, like see what works out. <laughs> um, I am the majority leader now in the Maryland House of Delegates. I'm also chair of the education subcommittee. Um, more importantly, I am a, a former middle school teacher. I taught for 11 years at um, Lauderman Middle School, which is a high needs middle school in Montgomery County. Um, so, you know, the student population I was teaching looks a lot like the student population where we see in so many school systems across the state. You know, close to half or more <laughs> students living in poverty. At the school I taught at, 60% of our student body were either English language learners or had at some point uh, been English language learners. Um, and an incredibly diverse school. Um, and that's not atypical now in Maryland schools. Um, the, the work that our schools are doing is, as I'm sure Britt mentioned, increasingly complex and increasingly challenging, and, and we are not providing our schools with the resources they need to do the job. Um, and, and that has having an impact. And just one example of that, Britt mentioned the statistic that now half of our teachers are leaving the profession within a couple of years. Um, when I started teaching less than 20 years ago, it was about a quarter. So in 20 years, we've seen that sort of uh, degrading of interest in the profession. Um, and we need to, um, you know, the, the Commission's done an extraordinary job trying to come up with the best possible recommendations for uh, what we need to do for our schools, but I want to I sort of re-emphasize something Britt said at the end of uh, what he was saying a second ago. Maryland happens to be a very prosperous state. We do pretty well in Maryland, not for everyone, and that's something we need to fix. But we are a pretty wealthy state, and the reason for that is our economy is rooted in fields that require a high level of education, right? Feds, meds, and eds, right? The federal government, the hospitals and biotech industry, and our educational institutions like Hopkins and College Park and UMBC that are not only educating people but producing high quality research that's turning into the next generation of companies for Maryland. If we do not maintain our educational competitiveness, we will lose our economic competitiveness. It is a certainty. So it is absolutely essential that we implement the recommendations of this commission. And I'm going to be one of the people in Annapolis who's tasked with trying to make that happen. Um, so let me start from literally the top. The presiding officers of both houses of the legislature are absolutely committed to making sure that we implement these recommendations. In, in the House of Delegates, um, the uh, Blueprint for Maryland's Future, this bill, is going to be House Bill 2. House Bill 1 is going to be a companion bill that aims to try to um, invest in school construction in a long overdue way and try to bring our school facilities up to code. So at the same time, we're fixing the school buildings and providing the resources our teachers need to do their job in the classroom. Um, the President of the Senate is equally committed to that goal, but it's going to be challenging for a couple of reasons. One, as Britt mentioned, at the end of 10 years, over the course of this legislation, it's going to be expensive. Right? Now the good news is it's not as expensive as it sounds at first glance um, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the natural inflation in the education budget, which would have, you know, which would increase education funding over time anyway, 
Um, now the commission's recommendations will redirect that funding in different ways than they would be directed now. Um, another is that we've already started over the last couple years making hard decisions to get money flowing into the funds that will help fund the blueprint. In fact, the first two years of the blueprint are already paid for under budget decisions we've made previously. It's really only in the third year that we need to start picking up new revenue. And that's where the fight, the political fight, is going to be. I don't think there's any disagreement among members of the legislature that the commission has come up with high quality recommendations for the types of education policy reforms we need to be making. I think that, that the, the, the work that Brit has done and that the members of the commission have done is extraordinary. I mean, these are the best minds we have in Maryland education, and they've produced some incredible recommendations. Um, the, the, the disagreement is over how to pay for them. And unfortunately, we also have a bit of a disagreement with the governor, who uh, seems to think that we shouldn't pay for them at all, um, and has been raising money, in fact, holding a high-dollar fundraiser down in Maryland Live, um, to uh, put money into a super PAC, uh, part of whose goal is to oppose these recommendations. Now, that's disappointing, but not unexpected. Uh, the governor has never been a particularly strong advocate of public schools. Um, but it is entirely possible to overcome that opposition. And first of all, the people of Maryland don't agree with the governor. By overwhelming margins in all of the polling, the early polling we've seen related to this, the people of the state of Maryland support strong investment in our public schools. It's unquestionable that the people want us to do this. Right? Um, two, I think the reality is, is that the governor has less influence in Annapolis than one would think, given his position. He frankly doesn't engage a whole lot with those of us in the legislature. So um, whether this legislation happens or not is going to be up to the 188 of us in the state. Um, and the tough decisions that we're going to have to make over the next few months. Um, those tough decisions as pertains to, to revenue um, are, are uh, there, there are some challenges in finding money. Um, Maryland's revenue picture is not as strong as it was in the early 2000s. Um, we are still uh, kind of just clawing our way back from the Great Recession and getting back to uh, the, the level of health in our revenues that we'd like to see. Um, at the same time that that's happening, we've seen uh, the federal government invest less in the federal workforce and in all sorts of programs that have historically been beneficial to the state of Maryland. So we are at the same time pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps out of the, the revenue hit we got from the economy and dealing with bad decisions by the federal government. Um, so to find new money on top of that, to pay for the Kerwin recommendations for the Blueprint for Maryland Future, Maryland's Future, um, is politically difficult, but we have options out there. And some of them, I'm sure you've already heard mentioned in the media, um, kind of the politically easier options, the, the low-hanging fruit options. Um, the uh, Supreme Court, uh, more than a year ago now, ruled that sports betting uh, cannot be limited to only certain states, as it was by federal law for many years. Um, and many of our neighbors, our neighboring gaming states, have already begun the process of legalizing sports betting in uh, casinos or online. So Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, D.C., all of them. The only bordering state that hasn't done it is Virginia, but they don't have any gambling at all. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a chunk of revenue potential there for the state. It's not massive. It's maybe, on the outside, 30, 40 million. Um, there is the potential to legalize and tax recreational cannabis, um, which again is something that state after state across the country has been doing. Um, depending on how that industry is structured and how the taxes are set, um, we could potentially see in the range of 100 to 200 million uh, in new revenue based on that. Um, but both of those, sports betting and recreational cannabis are issues where I think a lot of folks in the legislature would want to send it to the ballot and leave it up to the people of the state. Um, if that happens, you know, I would hope we would do it next year so that people could vote on it in the presidential election next fall. Um, and then we get into a whole range of other options, none of which I think um, has uh, have people sort of um, accepted as, yes, this is absolutely something we must do. 
Um, but essentially what's going to happen in the revenue discussion is that we're going to be aiming to piece together enough sources of revenue um, to pay for this. Um, we are likely not going to be, despite the misinformation that the governor's office has been putting out, um, going for a, a big increase in the income tax or a big increase in the property tax. Those are politically very difficult things to do, particularly over a veto. Um, so among the other options, um, it's been a decade now since Maryland has increased its tobacco tax. We now have a lower tobacco tax than many of our competitor states, particularly in the Northeast. Our tobacco tax is $2. Uh, Pennsylvania, I think, is two eighty-five. dollars New York and uh, New Jersey are over $4. Um, so there is potential for revenue there. We also do not apply the tobacco tax to electronic uh, cigarettes. Um, they pay sales tax, but not the tobacco tax. And given uh, the emerging science on the health impacts of vaping, that seems like a logical thing for us to start taxing on a comparable level to traditional tobacco. Um, there are a range of tax credits that we provide in the state um, in, in, under various taxes, but there are a bunch of them. Um, some of which are very effective credits. Some of which, perhaps, not so much. Um, so the speaker has already said that she's interested in us looking at those potential credits and figuring out if, if we can close some loopholes, um, particularly in corporate income tax, um, that will allow us to hold on to or recoup some necessary revenue. Um, and then there are some conversations which may or may not happen about uh, the sales tax. So um, our sales tax, like almost every state in the country, is tremendously outdated. And the reason for that is because sales taxes in Maryland are sales taxes on goods. And we no longer have a goods-based economy. We have a services-based economy. But the vast majority of services that exist in the state are not taxed at all. Um, so many states have started looking at things like services sales tax as a way to pay for priorities. Um, for example, there is no tax when you go to a tanning salon. There is no, despite seven other states doing it, no tax in Maryland on paid lobbying services. Um, there are a range of uh, politically viable options there that would be strongly supported by the people of Maryland. Um, but the decisions about what particular sources of revenue have not been made and will not be made likely for a couple of months. Um, there will be a series of discussions once the commission finishes its work in the next few weeks and makes its final recommendations. Um, and then the political work begins, and the organizing work begins. Um, to get this done, we will need advocates um, from the education community and elsewhere to hold our feet to the fire, to make sure that every member of the General Assembly and the governor knows that uh, making sure we have among the best public schools in the world is a, is a priority for the people of Maryland. Um, so we need you there marching. We need you writing letters, we need you emailing, we need you talking to everybody you know and trying to get them to do the same. Um, this is a once in a generation opportunity to make a huge difference for the kids in our schools. And, um, you know, the, to turn back to what I was saying at the beginning, yes, it's important for the economic future of our state, it's important for our quality of life. It's also, frankly, just a moral obligation. It's just a moral obligation and a constitutional obligation. The only area of policy, the only thing that the legislature is required to do under the Maryland Constitution, aside from passing a budget, is creating a system of public schools. And, um, you know, beyond that, the, the morality of it, I, I see as fundamental. I had the opportunity when I was a school teacher to, um, to meet kids who were from all kinds of backgrounds and um, kids who had everything they could ask for from their parents and kids who did. Um, I had students, and this is typical of every single school in the state of Maryland. I had students whose parents uh, were in jail or had been deported. I had students who were victims of abuse of various kinds. I had students who um, were not particularly happy to go home at the end of the day on Friday because the only meals they got were at school and they wouldn't be eating again until school breakfast on Monday morning. Um, I had students who never saw their parents because their parents worked in two or three jobs to get by. I had students that lived in two bedroom apartments with two other families. That's what these kids are bringing to school. And 
we have an obligation to make sure every single one of those kids has the support they need in school to be successful in life. And we can do it if we enact these recommendations, if we have the courage, the political courage to do it. Um, but we're going to need you to make that happen. Um, and I'll cut it off there and give a chance for 